Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on a Monday afternoon this time with myself, Jason, uh, one of the founders of UBS Education, and my colleague, Dan Escott. Hello, Dan. Hello, Jason. How are you? I'm very well. I'm using a uh, background of our old office. So that we're, uh, that's our old office there, uh, just up the road from where we are now, um, on an equally sunny day. Um, but today we're talking about the digital SAT, going to give a bit of an update on it. Um, Dan's going to let everyone know a few stats about the SAT, um, and we're together hopefully going to give everyone an idea of what they should be doing in order to prepare. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so hopefully everyone, can... Dan, does that look good? Yeah, I can see it perfectly, Jason. Great. So, um, we're going to give an update on the SAT. Um, we're going to uh, talk a bit about um, what's going on here. A little bit about UES first of all. Dan, would you mind muting yourself while I'm talking? Is that all right? Thank yeah, you. absolutely. I can do that. Um, so. We've been going for about 10 years, incredibly. We work with, think, with around half of all US applicants for the UK each year in some form or another. Um, we help students with all aspects of US applications. That's not just the testing, but also choosing colleges, the essays, the college, general consultancy, as you would um, call it, or college counseling. We also support schools with teacher training um, and uh, SAT and ACT courses, and everything like that. Um, and we work with around 200 schools in total. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about the digital SAT and what it is. Um, we're going to talk about some trends in SAT and ACT, especially in this era of test optional admissions. And we're going to um, talk about what that means and should students actually sit the tests. Of course, we're going to talk about the best way to prepare for the test. Um, and if there's time, Dan might talk about a spicy new SAT problem, or at least give an idea of the new sort of problems that are on the test. Okay, Dan, do you want to give everyone an idea of what the test actually is and what it looks like now? Sure. Uh, so the digital SAT uh, has been rolled out internationally as of March, and there's been three tests so far. Uh, March, May, and June. The next one is August 26th. Uh, this test is a shorter, more streamlined version of the previous paper-based test that's actually still ongoing in the United States. Uh, they don't make the shift until March uh, 2024. Uh, but essentially, instead of a three-plus-hour test, as you guys can see at the bottom, you're looking at a test that's two hours um, 14 minutes. Uh, what this means essentially is that there are uh, fewer questions, fewer questions, and each question carries more weight as a result. Uh, the content on this test is, I'd say, slightly narrower in scope than the previous SAT. It's a very manageable test and uh, straightforward enough to prepare for. Uh, and I know you guys can see what's on the screen, so I'm not going to tell you exactly how many questions per module, but I will tell you this, that it's an adaptive test. So how you do on the first module dictates whether you're slotted into the difficult or easier second module. Uh, I, with a lot of experimenting, I figured out that two thirds questions correct on the first module will usually get you into the more difficult second module. And once you're in the more difficult second module, you're able to, uh, you're looking at a score most likely between a 640 and an 800 for that verbal uh, verbal half of the test or that math half of the test. Uh, and the same holds true for math. You want to, on the first module, two thirds of the questions correct usually means that uh, you're going to be in the more difficult second module and you'll be able to score uh, into the high 600s up to an 800. Um, yeah, is there anything that you think I should add there, Jason? Well, I think you've, you've given a really good summary. And I think the interesting thing about this, Dan, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's um, much shorter. And I mean, significantly so compared to um, previous tests and compared to the ACT, which is still over three hours. 
I think what we're finding at the moment, the feedback from students who've done the first few tests is that they come out of the test feeling just much more comfortable, nowhere near as tired as they have been before. That makes a really big difference when you're doing a test that is quite fast and, and fast paced and you've got to concentrate for so long. Is that fair, Dan? Yeah, I think the, the key thing caveat I would say is that for me and for a lot of students, the first time you take this test, if you're not familiar with the question types and kind of diagnosing certain question types require, uh, you know, uh, solicit certain types of thinking. And if you're not used to kind of diagnosing the question types and saying, okay, on this question, really, I just need to follow the prompt. On this question, I'm really just being tested on vocabulary. On this question, okay, now my reading comprehension does come into play. So I think for a lot of students, at first, the test does feel exhausting. However, with adequate preparation and just becoming familiar with, you know, exactly what question types will arise, how often you'll see them and practicing them. Yes, I totally agree with you, Jason. It, it, it does uh, become more of a seamless test and not so much of a marathon as the older version. I mean, the, a key difference on this one is instead of having the seven paragraph reading passages with uh, 10 to 11 questions to answer, uh, that old reading section is no more. Uh, the reading and the grammar sections have just merged into these two verbal modules, first module and second module. Uh, and I'd say instead of having what used to be 52 reading comprehension questions, really only about maybe 16 to 20 questions are really pushing your reading comprehension skills. And then the other thing is every single question is its own paragraph. So instead of getting seven paragraphs and then 11 questions, you're, it's one paragraph, one question, which again can be exhausting if on a grammar question, you're really getting caught up in the content. It, on a grammar question, it doesn't matter. They're just testing you on, do you know how to use a semicolon or subject verb agreement? So that gets back to the idea that it's just very important to go into this test prepared so that you're not exhausting yourself uh, you know, trying to figure out what's going on on each question. It's good to know before exactly what your strategy is. Great. Yeah, I think that's really useful. And I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how to prepare later. Um, obviously, the question about this will always be, well, how do you choose between the SAT and ACT, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, but I think what might be useful is just seeing the trend over time, and I'll go on to the next screen here, um, of... Uh, the number of test takers and what's happening here. So if we look through this, 2018, the numbers were quite close, but SAT was higher. And um, the, the number actually started to increase. And this is uh, across the, um, the US. Um, the numbers were similar, but always slightly more in favor of the SAT. Um, actually, just before this, it's not shown on here, before about 2016, before the change to the the, the old SAT, um, the numbers were quite similar. And actually, they've been shifting more towards the SAT. Of course, the total number of test takers dropped significantly during the pandemic, and it started to come back. Um, but coming back in a way that is really favoring the SAT, our feeling, and Dan will have his opinion on this as well, our feeling is that the, the digital SAT means that just more and more people, particularly internationally and in the UK, people will take the SAT more than the ACT. Um, I, my personal take on this is that the SAT is just a more comfortable test. Um, there have been a few problems with the ACT recently, um, as there are always with digital tests, but the SAT doesn't suffer from as many of the problems because students get to use their own laptop and take it into the test centre rather than relying on the test centre's test. And generally it's run in schools which are kind of have a vested interest to make sure that test goes ahead. So. Generally speaking, the SAT, I think, is going to end up being a bit more of a comfortable test for people. Um, uh, but we'll watch this space to see just how dramatic that shift is. Um, Dan, any predictions for number of test takers? God, <laughs> I'm not going to pretend to be Nostradamus there, but I will say that uh, 
I, I think that I, I don't predict that the SAT uh, numbers will get to pre-pandemic level because a lot of schools have gone test optional, uh, which means some students are foregoing taking the test. Not something that I would recommend for most students. Uh, and I'll kind of inform and explain why, I, you know, the test still remains relevant in most cases. Uh, but the one thing I will say is that uh, the ACT works well if you're a very fast processor and a good STEM student. Uh, if you, the ACT has under one minute per problem uh, across the whole test, the SAT gives over one minute per problem. Uh, so if you're someone who is more methodical and needs more time to kind of process what's in front of you, the SAT is going to be the better test. Some students who start with the ACT get really good with the content, but they find they hit a ceiling because of the timing factor. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing when you're kind of starting out and trying to figure out which test is better uh, is even if you like the ACT better initially, you have to determine whether or not timing is going to play a role on that test for you. Yeah, I think that's a, a fair point. And we have a, a diagnostic test, as many people know, um, and that diagnostic test um, it helps people work out which test is best. And since the new SAT has come in, a large number of people have been uh, recommended the SAT compared to the ACT, which is a bit of a shift from before. And a lot of that to do is to do with the fact that the ACT is so much um, more time pressured than the SAT now. Uh, and you've really got to be on top of your maths and STEM, your maths and science, to be able to do the ACT very comfortably which is a bit of a shift from before, where before the our feeling was that the math was only a quarter of the test on the ACT. And therefore, if you were really good at maths, the SAT might be better because you could make more of an impact. And that is no longer so true because of the adaptive nature of the SAT and the fact that actually you just get more time on the SAT to get those things right. Okay, moving on. Um, Dan, you wanted to talk a little bit about the... Uh, percentiles on the SAT scoring? Sure. So it's it's interesting. Jason and I were at a, a conference recently, and one of the questions that came up was, uh, why don't standardized tests just use percentiles? Why is everything always kind of given a scaled score, and then we have to look up the percentile? It tends to almost put a, a veal over, uh, you know, what the score actually means. Uh, and I just want to make everyone cognizant of the fact that a 1260, a 1300, you're scoring, you know, in the 82nd, 86th percentile there of all test takers. Uh, a lot of students who are kind of, uh, you know, aspiring for top universities, they'll look at the published scores, the median score, and they'll see that the median score is a 1500 or above. Uh, and that is true for a lot of the most competitive universities because of uh, super scoring and test optional and other factors. The scores kind of have gotten a little inflated. Um, but essentially, the biggest thing is uh, in the UK, uh, the average test score is between a 1260 and a 1300. So a lot of students are actually already starting out really high on the test. The unfortunate thing that you'll see in a moment is... For a lot of universities, that score is great, and it will get you into plenty of universities. But if you're looking for kind of a top 100, um, you know, most competitive university, you really need probably a 1400, 1450, 1500 or above, depending on the school. Thanks, Dan. I think that's really good advice. Yeah, mathematicians looking at this will be a bit worried about how many 99s there are at the top of that scale, wondering how tight that curve really is. Now, you just alluded to um, the next slide, which is about uh, universities and how often students have been submitting tests. Um, and obviously with test optional, not everyone needs to submit tests anymore in order to be admitted. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's the best thing to do. Um, and when I say that, it's sometimes not a good idea to submit your scores. And sometimes it is a good idea to submit scores. So Dan, anything you want to say on this? Yeah, sure. I, a, a question I get that's an excellent question from parents and students is, does it make sense for me or my child to take this test, right? It, should we invest the time and energy 
you know, amidst a busy schedule into preparing for this test. Uh, I'm always a proponent of preparing for the test if possible, just because I, I think that the college readiness skills that preparing for the test, what it builds, uh, I feel like a lot of those skills are, are good lifelong skills that you will want to cultivate. Uh, but I also understand that students are busy and they have a lot going on. So kind of to get down to it, uh, what I did is I, I looked at the common data set for uh, kind of more competitive schools that have uh, published their 2022-2023 incoming class of freshmen. And just what you'll see here is you'll see how many, uh, what percentage of these incoming freshmen have submitted SATs and ACTs. Uh, and what you'll notice, aside from Boston College, which is an outlier, is that at these schools, two thirds of students have submitted test scores. What you may notice with Princeton, is you may say, wait a minute, 121% of students can't, you know, cannot have submitted test scores. Princeton asks students to submit all scores, whether it's SAT or ACT. Uh, so what you'll see in that one is students who've submitted both scores. So students kind of being double counted on both. Uh, but essentially, if you think about it, the 2022 incoming class were year 12s or juniors in 2020, 2021. So that's still in the midst of the pandemic. So I my guess would be that these numbers may even rise a little bit more uh, in this upcoming year, uh, meaning that really the best way to give yourself the best chance of getting into a university, uh, it means having a score that's above that university's median and being able to submit that score. Uh, yeah. If your score is below the university's median, it doesn't really help your application. Yeah, and it's probably worth stressing that this is a decision that shouldn't be made lightly. You've got to really think through the repercussions of submitting or not su submitting and getting some advice on it. Um, and that is something we can advise on. Um, it's not the case that just by virtue of having done a test, you look good because actually what you might be providing the university is evidence that you are not able to cope academically at the university if you are below the, the average of a student applying. You also have to remember that there are, might be good reasons why people submit low scores and are admitted to universities. It might sometimes be because of sports, it might be because of other things, um, and scores, just like everything else, are looked at in context of the background of the student. Um, so you have to be very, very careful there. Dan, you're right, the general sort of rule is if you're above the median, you're probably okay to submit. And and the one thing I just wanted to add, if, uh, the median SAT score, what you'll notice is that all of these scores are above that 1260 to 1300, right? So that kind of 85th percentile, these schools are, are, are all pushing for scores anywhere from the 99th percentile, uh, maybe to about the 90th percentile. Uh, and this isn't true for all schools, but if you're looking at the most competitive ones, this is kind of what the landscape looks like. Yeah, it's a good point. Okay, and we've got some demographics here about the SAT and about um, the relative percentage of, of people achieving different scores. What are these things that you've highlighted here then? So this is interesting. We, we have the Supreme Court decision that's, uh, essentially said over uh, affirmative action uh, can no longer be applied to the admissions process, meaning that race is no longer considered as a, a factor. But something to be cognizant of is that Asian Americans and Caucasians have scored higher on these standardized tests. And what test optional has essentially done is it's given other uh, underrepresented groups, uh, you know, a, a chance to get in without the test score. Uh, it's hard to say what will happen now that race isn't necessarily being considered a factor. Um, but again, what I generally tell uh, families when they ask about whether or not an SAT score is helpful, uh, yes, because uh, with test optional, more students are uh, applying to schools that they wouldn't have been able to apply to before. If the test score is no longer kind of this binary gatekeeper, 
then it means that student, some students are getting in without test scores. But as you saw on the previous slide, at most schools, those who are getting in are those who are submitting test scores. And those who are getting in without test scores just mean that, you know, the, the pool has become increasingly more competitive. There are students who are able to uh, matriculate at the school who would have been prohibited by the test score in the past. Right. Thanks, Dan. OK. What have we got on this slide, Dan? So this is just the same thing for the ACT. Okay. So es essentially, um, Asian Americans and Caucasians uh, generally score higher on these tests. Mm -hmm. And uh, other minority groups uh, have historically not scored as well on these standardized tests. Great. OK, and now you've got some data about, well, I would say the last two months. We don't have the June data yet. Um, but this is quite interesting because this is the average for the UK versus the average for the world. Um, and you can see that the average for the UK on these scores is higher than the average for the world. First of all, Dan, why is that? And what does that mean for UK students? I think a lot of students who have aspirations to go to school in the US, um, I mean, it, it, it typically means that you're, you're coming uh, from, from means to do so. Going to school in the US is, if you're able to get a scholarship, then uh, it can be fairly reasonable. But if you go to school without a scholarship, you can be looking anywhere from 20,000 to 60,000 uh, know, US dollars a year. Um, so I think UK test takers uh, who have aspirations to go to school in the US tend to come from you know, very strong supported academic backgrounds. Uh, a, a question I get a lot of times from uh, UK parents is, you know, is it an advantage that my child is an international applying to the US? And it depends on the school, but as far as test scores, you know, the expectation for UK students is that you're scoring high uh, because your peers are scoring high. Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, it's, it looks good for the UK. This is the starting point. Um, but you do have to bear in mind that, like you said, that what students in the UK are aiming for is something different to the average American. Um, and we've got some more numbers here. Uh, this looks like a concordance table. Am I right, Dan? Yeah, so I, 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 I where, whenever I can demystify these tests and how they're scored and what's on them and just simplify it, I want to take every opportunity to do that. So um, what you'll see is that the difference between, if we look at the blue, uh, the difference between scoring kind of, uh, you know, 792 and 800 on the verbal, the blue is a verbal, is just 10 questions uh, from a 792 and 800 to, you know, 670, which would put a student, uh, you know, roughly around the UK average, maybe slightly above. So it's not a huge difference. If you if you remember from earlier, this is a shorter test. In fact, this Right here, you're seeing 66 questions. The verbal is actually only 54 questions. This table is for a slightly longer version of the digital SAT for students who have paper-based accommodations. But the point that I'm trying to make is to improve your score from maybe the 80th percentile to the 98th percentile, it's only a handful or so of questions. You're really not looking at uh, you know, dozens and dozens of questions because it's such a short test, uh, which really comes down to kind of a later point, which is that it's so important to know what you're going to see and how you're going to see it. Because if you're trying to operate at the top level, uh, you want to be entirely prepared. Uh, and that way, it's really hard to uh, have any question kind of catch you out on the test. Great. Yeah, that's useful. And again, I think what you say is true, that you can see that you've only got a few questions you need to change and get right in order to jump up the scores quite a lot. Um, and then equally, it's quite um, bunched up together at the very top end. So um, it can be quite frustrating, I think, sometimes to go, well, I've got a 7, 770, I'm trying to get an 800, but actually um, it's 
you have to work really hard just to try and change that very small bit at the top. Um, okay, and on, I think what's worth talking about now is what students can do to try and prepare for this test. And, and one thing that often gets talked about is this idea that you, you either can't prepare for the test and you can't practice it the way you do other exams or that no one can teach you it. And now we're coming at this from the perspective of people that do teach the SLT. And obviously we've got an opinion about this. There are plenty of people who do it on their own, but whatever happens, there are patterns in what people do in order to get good at this test. Um, and I think it's worth us talking a little bit about this. So I'm going to start off, Dan, and you can jump in. But um, first of all, even though there isn't a curriculum document that tells you exactly what you must and um, must study and, and then is on the test, nevertheless, that content is pretty standard in that it very rarely changes. Occasionally, we see something new come up and go, oh, that's interesting. They put that on there. But for instance, on the maths, there is only really a certain amount of maths that's ever going to be on there. And the way they ask those questions is going to be very similar. So if students can learn that content and understand all the topics behind it, they shouldn't have any surprises in the test. Um, and the, the way that it comes up as well, the, the type of question that gets asked is very similar every time. So once you become very familiar with that pattern and you've done these tests a million times, even if you've done the same question over and over again, you will start to understand what part of the brain you have to use to answer that question. Um, and Dan, this brings us on to this idea of muscle memory through repetition. Um, I think there's a lot of bad press about learning by rote, but actually for getting the basics right, my opinion has always been that actually that's quite a good thing. If you just take it for granted, those rules are ingrained into your head, um, then you can start to do the harder stuff more easily. Do you agree? I completely agree. Uh, yeah, if the foundational uh, skills come naturally because they've been you know, practiced to that level, uh, then it frees your mind up to kind of engage with the more difficult aspects on the harder questions. Uh, the other thing that's really important about kind of having that muscle memory is if you're looking at a question and you know you've already seen 40 just like it and you've practiced them, then you're able to kind of cut through that question like a knife through butter and, and get to the next one. And what it does is I've had a lot of students tell me that on the second math module, the last you know, five questions tend to be kind of a next level, just a little bit more difficult. And I've, I've found the same, uh, you know, through doing these tests myself. Uh, and I find that for those questions, you really do want to have time to engage with them. Both, as Jason said, you want to have kind of the foundational skills so that you can kind of engage uh, with the question at a baseline level. Uh, but you also want to have those foundational skills for all the prior questions so that you're able to go through those, uh, you know, with a lot of fluidity and have time for the harder questions at the end. Uh, I, I hope Roger Federer isn't up, upset that I used his likeness here, but the idea is with the sport, with you know, an instrument, whatever it may be, you know, you practice a backhand again and again and again, so that when things are happening at game speed and the stakes are high. It's, it's second nature. It feels natural. And in fact, if anything, you're ready for the moment and you want that moment because you're just so confident in the level of preparation you put in and, you know, what you've seen before the test. Um, and yeah, this, this test is very defined. The other thing is I, I spend a lot of time, a lot of time updating our materials to make sure that they're in line with exactly what's been on the latest test. Uh, the one thing I never want to hear from a student is I saw something that you didn't prepare me for. So there's a lot of uh, effort that goes into making sure that our 15 verbal worksheets and our 17 math worksheets uh, define exactly what you're going to see and how you're going to see it so that, you know, you become Roger Federer on test day or maybe, you know, pick your analogy. Great. Thanks, Dan. And on that note... Um, if we 
uh, just talk about what students' experiences of these mock tests and things have been um, and how it helps them uh, in terms of the real test day. Um, you've got some quotes here, Dan. So um, on the mock test, when students are doing a full-time test for the first time, they say things like information overload, there's too much stuff coming at you very quickly. Not sure what the question was asking because you hadn't seen that type of question before. Running out of time, classic thing on any multiple choice test. But then after they've done the real test, positive comments such as, I felt very comfortable um, on how to navigate each problem. I think some of the exact questions we practiced appeared on the test. Last two to three questions of math module were difficult, but I'm pretty sure I nailed module one. Um, so th this kind of highlights how important it is to A, understand the content and the technique and, and really get it ingrained into you. And two, how important it is to do mock so that you, it's not just so that you learn the stuff, it's so that you understand what the feeling is like doing the test. So when you come to the real one, it's not, you're not scared about the feeling of having to do that test all in one go. Um, okay, just a, a couple of things here to finish off. Dan, you've got this lovely slide here highlighting um, some of the different uh, things within, I think this is the verbal section. Anything you want to talk about this and the different areas that people need to know? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief here, but essentially the entire 54 verbal questions on the test fall into four broad categories. And depending on which one of these four categories determines your approach to the question. Uh, if it's a grammar question, you don't want to get caught up in content. You're just being tested on whether or not you can match a subject to a verb, whether you know how to combine two independent clauses. So if you know the grammar rules and you've practiced the question types, then those questions take maybe 30 seconds or less because they're not testing any higher level thinking. It's, it's just rote and knowing how to apply grammar rules. Uh, conversely, the main idea questions, so worksheets 110, 111, 112, and 113, those are the ones that are really kind of the reading comprehension questions. So those are the ones where you're going to want to uh, make sure you really dig in and understand what you're reading. And then for each of those questions, there are specific approaches and things to look out for. Again, this, this test is a very defined and knowable test. Um, it can be a very comfortable test as long as you're happy to put in the time so that you know what your approach is and what you're going to see uh, before you sit down on test day. Right, really useful. Okay, and let's talk about what students should be doing. I've put a few things on there just to talk about. First of all, start early, don't underestimate um, how much time you need and don't underestimate the test. Uh, as Dan said, it's very learnable, very coachable, but you can't just think, I'm going to do this like I did my GCSEs, which is cram the knowledge two weeks before. It's not just knowing the stuff. It's getting that muscle memory so that you recognize the patterns and it's just repetition every time. So if you start early, I always say start early and do little and often. Um, students often ask me, and I'm sure they ask you, Dan, how much should I be doing? How much should I practice? Obviously, this depends on your starting point and what you're aiming for. But I always say, this, you've got three months to do this, and you put 20 minutes aside every morning to do um, work on this. Each week, you would have done um, a full test. And after a month, you would have done four full tests. And after three months, you would have done 12 full tests of work. That is a lot of work you've put in. At, for very little effort each day. Now imagine what you can achieve if you do a little bit more each day and add in some mock tests there as well. Um, that means that suddenly you've trained your brain to really recognize these patterns um, and should find it quite easy. And if you get to that stage, this test can actually be a really nice test to do because it's you're just not thrown by anything that comes up. But the other thing is always ask for help. Um, as I said, plenty of people do this test themselves. Um, we think that around half of all test takers get some sort of help with courses or tuition in the UK. Um, so don't be afraid to ask for help. And uh, if you do want to help, we're here to help you. And on that note, um, if you want to speak to me or one of my colleagues about applications in general and how we can support you, feel free to book in a free call. We do have some other webinars and stuff coming up any teachers who are watching, we've got our teacher training on 18th of September. 
but we also run courses. We've got week-long and weekly courses um, for the SAT and ACT. Next one starts uh, a week today, I think, 10th of July. Um, so you can book into that if you go to our website, for slash courses. Your school may also be running a school's course for the SAT or ACT in uh, September or perhaps next term after that in January. So do ask them as well. Um, we have private tuition for SAT and ACT, probably the best way to get ahead on this test because you get really bespoke help focused on the things that you um, need to work on. There's our diagnostic test, free for any test takers. Most test takers in the UK and probably Europe take this test. Um, so definitely a good idea to take that to see where you're at. And if you're interested in sports scholarships and things, we can help you with that. Um, and there's our contact details. But most importantly, do feel free to book in a free call with us and we can chat to you about your applications. Um, so I think we're gonna stop it there um, and just see if there are any spicy questions from anyone. So anyone who's on the call, if you want to ask a question, feel free to pop it into the Q&A box. Very happy to answer that. In the meantime, is there a particular spicy problem you wanted to talk about? Um, I'll see oh. you this one. Yeah, this is a really good one. Uh, so this was something that did not really come up on the pre previous SAT, but it's something I've seen almost every time on the digital SAT. And I anticipate a lot of students are going to miss this question, uh, especially if they're not prepared for it. If you're prepared for it, it's not bad at all. Uh, but essentially, the answer for this one is going to be C. And a lot of students aren't used to seeing that semicolon come after the uh, uh, what's called the conjunctive adverb, the word however. Uh, mm -hmm. But in this case, it, it belongs there because what you'll notice is the second part of this problem, uh, the second part of that second sentence is not a contrast. It's actually emphasizing what the first part says. So the first part says they were not the first in England to adopt the literary modes of classical antiquity, however. And then the second part uh, describes who came before them, right? Who was before them. So it says some of the most prominent figures of the early Renaissance were also influenced by Greek and Roman literature. So what you notice there is you do not have a contrast at all uh, because you don't have a contrast that, however, actually needs to be part of the first independent clause uh, and not attached to the second one. A lot of students are going to choose D, uh, even if they, the one thing that most students, not most students, the one thing that students who prepare will know is that if you have two independent clauses, which you do on this problem, you're going to need a semicolon. So immediately A and B are just not options. So those are both examples of something called a comma splice. Uh, and then it's just about choosing between C and D. And then it's C because of the rule we just spoke about. But again, if independent clauses and comma splices, is, if this jargon doesn't mean anything right now, that's absolutely okay. Uh, this is all stuff that you'll be able to become familiar with fairly quickly. It's it's. It's not often explicitly taught in school, but it's it's straightforward and easy enough to pick up on. Yes. I'm going to add to that. I think there is a contrast here, but the contrast is actually the the whole of that second sentence is contrast, contrasting the first sentence. So you could put it however at the beginning of they were not the first in England. You could say, however, they were not the first in England to adopt the literary modes of classical antiquity. Yes, it would be yeah, exactly. You'd be able to do semicolon, however, comma, if you're putting it yeah. uh, in in that part of it. Exactly. Great. Right. Thanks, Dan. I'm going to stop sharing here. Um, and I'm just going to say thank you very much, Dan, for helping us out with your update. Um, if, if anyone's got any questions at all, feel free to drop us an email, info at ueseducation.com. Um, Dan will probably answer your email if it's something to do with a test question. He likes nothing better than to do that. Um, so thank you, Dan, and thank you to everyone watching, and goodbye. Awesome. Thank you.